Hi everybody, my name is Paula Whitfield and I work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, within the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, or NCOS for short. Today I'm going to be talking about island restoration to meet triple win engineering with nature outcomes. And I wanted to begin by acknowledging all of my co-authors that are listed on this slide. This is truly a collaborative project between five different agencies who've come together to investigate this island restoration, which you see on this slide. This project is also supported by the Engineering with Nature Initiative, and I'll be talking about the roles of each of the partners throughout this talk. So Engineering with Nature, it is a core-led initiative, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers initiative, that's housed within the Engineer Research and Development Center. And it emphasizes the use of natural processes and systems to achieve these triple win outcomes. So this is in addition to engineering function. It means projects having social, environmental, and economic benefits. This involves the use of natural and nature-based features or infrastructure like dunes, reefs, marshes, and islands, which is the focus of this talk, the restoration of Swan Island to achieve um, triple one outcomes. We're working in Chesapeake Bay, which is located on the east coast of the U.S. It is the largest estuary in the U.S. Swan Island is a 25-acre, 10-hectare island um, that is part of the Nat Martin National Wildlife Refuge, and it's located in mid Chesapeake Bay on the east side. Now, Tangier Sound separates the string of islands from Martin National Wildlife Refuge to Tangier Island from the mainland. And Swan Island is also just north of Smith Island, where communities founded in the late 1700s still reside. Now the, the issue is that island loss in the Chesapeake Bay is increasing at an alarming rate. If you look at this figure on the right, David Schulte and his co-authors, they found a 66% decrease in Tangier Island since 1850. And another study found that islands in Tangier Sound lost 21% of their area in 14 years. This also resulted in large decreases in nesting bird populations. Sea level rise, subsidence, and erosion are all driving the loss of islands throughout the bay. So we know that islands are valuable habitat, especially for migratory birds, but what is the coastal resilience value of islands? They're considered an important part of the multiple lines of defense strategy, in part due to their size and potential to have a greater area of influence and a diversity of habitats that can be incorporated. The infographic on this slide is an idealized rendering of the benefits of a restored island versus a degraded island. The restored island shown in the bottom panel has a greater range of elevations that support a greater diversity of vegetative habitats and likewise has greater coastal resilience potential in the form of reduced erosion and wave energy. But we wanna put numbers on this. What is the quantitative coastal resilience performance of islands? This is an uncertainty that is often considered a barrier to implementation and is the focus of our research. Like Tangier Island, Swan Island, and Martin National Wildlife Refuge are eroding. Before restoration, the low-lying part of Swan Island consi consisted of low intertidal marsh that was at suboptimal elevations. You can see the marsh fragmentation in this top image of Swan Island. In the bottom image, after sediment placement, this shows the proximity of Swan Island to the town of Yule. So Swan Island has a direct coastal resilience function in that it acts as a natural wave break for the town of Yule. The Swan Island restoration involved the beneficial use of dredge sediments. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Baltimore District they used a hydraulic cutter head dredge to place approximately 60,000 cubic yards of sediment on the low-lying footprint of Swan Island. 
This was completed in April 2019. Now, getting back to the triple win outcomes, there were also economic benefits and efficiencies created for the Baltimore district. And this was due in part to the close proximity of the federal navigation channels to Swan Island. These channels are shown in red on the image at the right. There are also social and economic benefits realized for Smith Island communities. And this is because these navigation channels are their lifeline for transportation, commerce, fishing, and tourism. Following sediment placement, the island was graded to elevations that would support areas that include low dunes on the north side, with one of these dune features also being protected by concrete ajax and also low marsh grading to high marsh from east to west for a total of 200,000 plants that were installed. And finally, we conducted pre-placement monitoring in 2018 and then post-placement monitoring in 2019 and just recently in 2020. So now I want to transition to the conceptual model because this model guides the selection of our monitoring parameters to quantify the coastal resilience performance. The conceptual model includes three main components that include hydrodynamic, ecological, and topographic parameters along with the sediment and the feedbacks and linkages between them. This conceptual model is being used to develop an integrated hydrodynamic and ecological model to answer questions such as those shown on the slide for one and two. So for example, um, how resilient is the island to sea level rise and storm events? For just looking at wave or examining wave attenuation impacts on Swan Island, we're using a coupled ADSERC and ST wave model called Sea Storm. And I want to point out this modeling effort is being led by Erdic's integrated modeling team. The monitoring parameters and locations of sample collections are shown on this slide. The hydrodynamic parameters of waves, currents, water level, and also total suspended solids are being collected on four platforms that are situated around the island, as you see here. This component is also being led by Erdic. Now the ecological parameters, these involve the collection of vegetation and sediment characteristics with the sampling designed to capture the gradient of elevations and habitat types on the island. So these sample collection locations are shown by the round dots that are on the image. So ANCOS and Maryland Department of Natural Resources are leading this component. And finally, the topographic component of elevation is being collected at each of the vegetation plots on the island. In addition to that, we're collecting shoreline position and the entire island elevations are being mapped using drones. And INCOS is the lead on this component. Now, speaking of drone-based products, here are two examples of drone-based imagery products from 2019. So this is a few months after sediment placement and planting. The image on the left is a georectified composite image or photographs that will allow us to conduct habitat classifications and quantify the change in habitat over time. The image on the right is a digital elevation model or DEM also from 2019 where we will, this will allow us to do cut and fill analysis with future data sets like those we just collected in 2020 that are not yet processed. But these DEMs will allow us to quantify the change in elevation over time on the island. So obviously analyzing our data from 2020 and doing these comparisons over time are a primary next step. But we also have some adaptive management actions planned for the island. So you can see from the 2020 image that the high marsh near the forest is doing very well, but that the low marsh plantings did not have great survival. The, the green patches that you see on the left are primarily low marsh vegetation that survived the placement and is growing vegetatively. 
but it needs some help. So one of the planned actions by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is to plant more low marsh in spring 2021. So in addition, we're continuing model development using field data to evaluate and apply the model to our research questions. And finally, we're updating our monitoring and adaptive management plan, which not only serves as a blueprint for the project team, but also ensures that the process is transferable to other islands and nature-based systems. And so on my final slide, just circling back briefly to projects with triple win outcomes, I really think this headline says it all. Miami-Dade wants mangroves and islands for coastal protection instead of 10-foot walls. You know, when I saw this, you know, I started thinking, you know, you can build walls for coastal protection, but no one is going to want to look at 10-foot walls. And there are not a lot of co-benefits associated with a wall. So if we can quantify the storm protection benefits of natural systems like islands, this may help to re-engineer nature back into our cities and communities. And with that, I want to thank everybody and ask you to please feel free to contact me if you would like more information. Thanks again. Bye.